The good old clap, take one. That's right. How many of you knew what you wanted to be when you were seven years old? I did. I wanted to be a world champion. Hey, is there honesty involved in this podcast? Can we be honest? You can shut your fucking lips. And then I'll just say, put them up once. Let's go. He's like, you look too pretty on the wave. Get ugly. We can talk about DMT if you want. Let's talk to your boxes. All right. Jack Robinson, 2021 CT rookie and the hope of Western Australia um, on the lineup. Thanks for joining us today, man. Thanks for having us, Dave. Yeah, stoked to be here. So it's, it's early where you are. Um, how are you doing so far today? Where are you today? And, and who are you hanging with? Uh, yeah, it's we're back in West Oz and um, back in my own bed, own house. Um, yeah, just, just really happy to be here. It's a uh, it's really a nice part of the world, so um, yeah, stoked to be here. I'm on my farm property, actually, just around the corner from where everyone else is staying. Um, so I'm just snuck back home for a bit, um, and yeah, just, just yeah, good to be back in the back in the hood. <laughs> how how long has it been since you've been home? Uh, eight months. I left. Eight months. Yeah, yeah. I left uh, last year. Went to the Goldie for a few months, getting ready, and then. Um, yeah, went to Hawaii for four months and then came back to Oz, did the comps, and now I'm home. So, oh, yeah. man. <laughs> what a mission. Key, <laughs> key, st- key still worked. The cable still worked. Everything was okay. Yeah, yeah. Everything's, everything's all good still. But, um, yeah, it's nothing like home. So, good to be here. And uh, I know it's early there, but um, I presume you haven't surfed yet today. But is, are you planning to after we talk? Yeah, I'm going to go surf Margaret's after this. Um, we surfed all day yesterday. Everyone was out there. Um, yeah, just just getting used to it again. It's funny getting used to the bigger waves again. I almost forgot how to do it for a few hours. I was like trying to figure it out. And then um, <laughs> I was like, okay, finally, finally did it. I think everyone else is in the same boat because we've all been on the East Coast for a while. So that's fair. That's good though. That's fair. So so there, there is, and I'm just going to say it, there's been a lot of excitement around this episode with you. It's been requested a ton. Um, there was a lot of interest when we, we asked listeners for questions. And, uh, you know, in thinking about the conversation, you know, broadly, there's kind of two ways this probably goes. You know, the first mm-hmm. is your, your basic pro surfer interview where we talk about traction plaid uh, traction pad placement and, you know, kind of like aspirational cliches about wanting them the world title. And this isn't yeah. meant to attend in offend anybody, but it, you know, it's pretty standard stuff for a lot of early 20 year olds. But the second, which sure. doesn't apply to everyone, but probably does to you is the less standard and maybe more in depth for you, particularly on how you developed into who you are so young and your experiences growing up inarguably um, in the spotlight and how that's kind of shaped who you are today. And I think we're probably going to land in the, in the middle, but since you and I have only really spoken a couple of times, I figured I'd call the game out up top. How, how does that sound? Yeah. Yeah. Let's go straight to it. Yeah. It's, it's funny. Like I, um, no, I've watched all the episodes and I, you know, see everything, but now, um, yeah, I'm, I'm good to go. We can, we can go into whatever. And, um, yeah, that's, it's a big journey and a lot of things to talk about really so yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's cool <laughs> so so yeah. it, it's been this interesting thing this is my i've done this for 15 years and when i started was oh six so it was right during the kelly andy stuff on the men's tour and the australian women have just been so dominant for so long since i think lane and then chelsea georgeson and then steph and tyler and uh, chris has obviously been in the mix but it, surfing in australia is such a a serious sport, like it's a legitimate mainstream sport and um, has been for so, so long. But the last male Australian to win a world title was Mick Fanning in 2013. I want to get to the sort of the, the, the younger Jack Robinson hype, but we'll start with the second wave of hype in terms of how I'm classifying it, of you qualifying this year and a ton of sort of just overt pressure on this is our next world title contender. Do you, do you feel that on a day-to-day? You used to, but not anymore, uh, even if people still talk about it. Uh, I used to feel it when I was younger because mm. you feel way more when you're younger. It's, I mean, and just being around, I think every sport, it always, it always is going to have that, you know. Um, but even being around all the pressure from a young age, I think I just, it, was, it either could have gone two ways. I either 
could have taken it on board or or I could have, you know, probably crumbled with it like that. Or oh, I just, I had to perform under pressure. Even when I qualified in Hawaii last year, there were so many things sort of against me and, um, you know, just it was, I needed a big result, just everything, you know. And um, I think just performing under pressure, it's, uh, that's where the best get made really. So... Yeah. yeah. And you're still like, and I mean, it's, it'd be one thing if you were sort of late twenties and you're a rookie and there was sort of a dip, you know, in terms of like yeah. all this hype and then you either crumbled or you just have to kind of work your way through it, but you're still such yeah. a young guy. I, I'm curious if you ever felt any kind of a dip in terms of not so much the hype, but like, oh my God, like everyone expects me to be the world's best surfer. I'm just not. And then there was a period of time when you had to kind of go work on it. And now you feel like all right, well, you know, maybe the hype's a little bit much and I try to block it out, but I do feel ready. You know, did you ever have like just a confidence dip between when you're really young and now? A dip, yeah, I would say, you know, when I was young and growing up here, um, you know, I, I, I wasn't worried too much about anything else. I would just be surfing and doing, you know, normal things as a kid and, and getting better at doing what I was doing. But uh, once I got in the QS and then, you know, you start the contracts get bigger, everything gets bigger. Um, you know, there's people that expect more. I probably had a dip for a couple of years on there. You know, I was, mm. I was, uh, I was going, oh, you know, not making any heats. So I was just going, what's going on? And, um, probably that's, that's when I had a dip. It was, it was those couple of years. It was, um, I was going, why, what am I doing? You know, why am I, what, am, why do I do this? Like what, I'm not doing it for all this, all this pressure. Why do I do this? And then, um, uh, yeah, I think just, with time, um, yeah, it was it was a funny thing. I kind of grew out of it, and um, yeah, it was probably good. Maybe when people forgot about me a little bit, because then I um, I almost just went and worked on myself more and and on the surfing and everything, and came back. So yeah, it, it's funny you say that too, because you know we we t when Pat Pat used to come on the podcast, we used to talk about this a lot. But like the parallels that that we used a lot were John and Kolohe when they qualified, um, just sort of as recent examples. And, right. and I said, man, like when Kolohe qualified, um, you can go back to the start of that year and look at like the Nike content that was being put out about him. Like, it, and it was like white wetsuits and he's surfing, you know, four foot gravels or probably two foot gravels, depending on where you're from. And, yeah. and like the tone and the coverage and the hype around him is like, he's a rookie, he's gonna win the world title like right away. Yeah. You know, and yeah. he had yeah. a pretty good rookie season, but like any yeah. event where he wasn't in the finals, like people were just like disappointed, you yeah. know, because yeah. it didn't, yeah. Yeah. there's a yeah. weird kind of ghost about like the hype machine ghosted him up here and he was, he just wasn't meeting. It. I remember he made the quarterfinals in France that year, which is awesome as a rookie. And people were still like, ah, not good enough, you know? And then the alternative was someone like John, who same thing, like, like, probably very, very similar to you. And I'd like to talk about that friendship, but he had a yeah. ton of hype younger, younger uh, when he was younger. But then when he qualified at the midway point, it was almost by accident. And even when he qualified, people were like, well, I hope he does well at like pipe and chopes because we don't know how well he surfs outside of that. And it actually served him yeah. really well because he was somewhat under the radar, although that's kind of insane to think about. But it sounds like it's yeah. a little bit similar for you too. Yeah, it was. And, and I think it, yeah, there's so much, um, you know, things out there. And, you know, I I think also with all that, you end up trying to be too perfect. Like I surfed mm. so many heats or try to do everything so perfect that it was, you know, I wasn't really showing who I really was in the end. And then I was I was kind of just falling away off it. And, um, yeah, I think uh, just, yeah, you really just, everything can be going on, but you just got to stay true really and just do your thing. It doesn't matter. It's always going to be there, the, the hype or whatever, you know? So, um, yeah, but, yeah, it's, it's a funny thing. <laughs> yeah. Now let's talk, let's talk about where you grew up because you, you're West Australian born and bred. Did you grow up in the Margaret river region or some, or were you born somewhere else? No, I was, I was born in Perth, but then we moved down when I was five. Um, okay. Cause the waves, the waves are pretty big down here. So, don't want to start too young down here when it's like that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I grew up from around five down here. And, and yeah, this is, this has been my home since, you know, since traveling everywhere at least. Um, but yeah, right on the river here. And my main spots to surf was 
the river mouth inside the box and then slowly, you know, between gas and the box and North Point, that's pretty much the training ground. Like between those few ways, that's where I grew up. So, um, yeah, it was, it was good growing up here. It was, I feel like the, the coastline, just the surroundings, everything kind of, uh, shaped, shaped what I am, you know, who I am today. It's, um, gives you a pretty broad sort of view on things. It's good. What was the family like? Your mom, dad, brothers, sisters? What was it like when you were younger? Yeah, so I was an only child. I was, I was just, just me. Um, but yeah, I kind of did a lot of things on my own. I was always, you know, I, was at, I was homeschooled as well. So had a lot of time, you know, to, to be flexible in the day and uh, go and surf, you know, all up and down the coast. You know, it was pretty cool. My parents... You know, didn't have to, didn't send me to school, which was, you know, a lot of other kids went to school. So I was, you know, was lucky enough to go up and down and, and put in the time and just, um, yeah, be, be free really just to kind of do what I wanted. And then, um, yeah, then we started, I started traveling around 12. That's when I got on Quicksilver and, uh, and yeah, that was, that was when it really all started. I, I think. I signed the contract when I was 11 and, and that's when I started traveling around. That was, uh, yeah, it was, it was me and Leo and Kanoa and that was where it started really. Well, like whoever the team manager was at the time should pat themselves on the back. Cause all you guys actually made the tour, which doesn't, doesn't happen that often. <laughs> young kids. Yeah. It's, it, it's pretty wild to think like, yeah, it was the, it was the, really the three kind of golden, Childs running around like the the young kids, you know, that were were on the team. So it was it was pretty good fun. You know, I was really fortunate to do that, and um, yeah, we had so much fun. That was yeah, five five years of traveling around with the boys, and um, yeah, was was the homeschooling decision like strictly so you could pursue kind of your passion and and ultimate profession as a surfer, or was, were it just just other reasons? I think. I think my dad always wanted that. And then, you know, my mom, she, she, yeah, I think, I think she, once she saw, you know, what I was leading to and what I was getting to, you know, it was, yeah. Cause no, no one else really did that here. It was almost there. I was looked at as, you know, like, Oh, like what's he doing? Like, cause he, he's the experiment kind of thing. And I was like, <laughs> what, what are these people saying? You know, like I'm just doing my thing. I'm a kid. And, uh, you know, just, I probably, it sort of, you know, it shaped who I am today, really. I just got, got to hang out with a lot of older people too when I was younger, which was, which was cool. I made friends anywhere, really, because I was mm. always going up and down the coast and um, I wasn't just, you know, stuck at school or whatever. I was, I was you know, doing a lot of things outside and, and making friends everywhere. So, yeah, I mean, I didn't really think about where it was going to, you know, being a pro surfer, but um, I definitely enjoyed it. I was just having fun. Yeah. What did, were there ever like, and I mean, this is insane cause you're still so young and already so successful, but was, were there ever other interests outside of surfing for you where you thought, well, you know, maybe I'm going to take a break from surfing and try whatever, like soccer, or I'm going to, or I really want to try school or, or like in terms of your career path, was there ever any questioning of like, well, I could do something different and I, and I want to, or was it just, I, and I get it if it was, cause it's so much fun, but like, yeah. was it just professional surfing the whole time? Uh, I mean, it was it kind of naturally just just came into that. I think it was – I wasn't really thinking too hard about, you know, being super competitive. I almost wanted to be an aeroplane pilot when I was a kid, you know. That was, that was one thing I would want to do, you know. I was kind of – you know, things like that interest me. But, um, yeah, I think this is – you know, this is what I did from such a young age. It was – you know, I think my dad saw, saw where it was going. I think that was his dream. So, you know, that's – that's what happened. It was, yeah, I, I just took to it and, um, yeah, I didn't really look back. Was it, yeah. was it, and I met your dad. He's, he's a really smart guy. Was, was it Trevor's dream for, did he want to be a professional surfer when he was younger or was it his dream for you or both? I think both. Um, yeah, it was, you know, he put, there was so much time I spent doing what I was doing. So, um, mm -hmm. he wouldn't have put me there if it, if it wasn't for that. Um, yeah, I think it was, he knew what it is. Yeah, he knew that he needed to put time into it. So, um, yeah. Well, and you must have, you must have, 
you must have had some sort of realization that you were pretty good before you were 11 when you started signing contracts with Quicksilver, right? Like, was there, or, I mean, maybe maybe you just always were. <laughs> you were just like, no, I've always been this good. It's just been that natural. But but like, yeah. was were there moments before then when you're like, ah, oh, yeah, this is going to be my job. This makes sense. Yeah, I, I know that a few years before that, I, I know we were holding off on, on some contracts and then it was just, you know, once we got to around 11, 12, that was when it started. And um, yeah, I think I, I sort of knew that it was going to go that way. Like, you know, once I, I got to around 10, just before it all happened, I, I kind of knew that it was going to going to be going that way um mm. you know you could just feel it and and yeah it was but I also had to enjoy it as a kid you gotta gotta still enjoy it there's everyone gets so worked up you know parents and everything you know that they, they want their kids to be pro surfers or whatever sport it be um but yeah you just I really got to enjoy it as well because even now I still think back on how my mindset was as a kid and when I was getting better and when I was getting better that's when I was really enjoying it, keeping it simple and just, you know, running on, on what I was, what I was doing here, you know, I was, I was having fun. So mm -hmm. I still got to come back to that nowadays. Oh, of course. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's sort of one of those things where it, there is, there is an interesting part of surfing, I think for people who work in it, um, athletes included for sure, where mm -hmm. there's like a blend of the personal and professional where you're like, well, I pers like, even if I didn't do this for a job, I'd want to surf, you know, but because it's my profession, there's this weird tension as opposed to, I'm sure the grass is always greener, but there's some sort of romanticizing of like, if I just worked a nine to five that had nothing to do with surfing, I wouldn't take my work home with me. I'd go surfing and I wouldn't worry about it, yeah. you know, and they kind yeah. of be delineated that yeah. way. Yeah. yeah it's, it, oh, go on, sorry. No, no, no. It's one of the, the very few sports or um, professions that we you actually can do, you know, as a lifestyle as well. You know, it's, it's also, you enjoy it too. And um, yeah, we're, we're pretty lucky to have that. So it's cool. I mean, you in a lot of ways, because this would have been mid to late oddies when you were 10, 11, 12, um, were probably, and maybe for in, maybe forever, kind of the high watermark of, of brands putting a lot of investment in really young surfers, you know, and there's not a lot of them out there, but it, it is interesting, right? Where, you know, surfing sort of, we talk about on this podcast a lot, like a community obsessed with the cult of youth, you know, where a lot of times they want to pay for potential as opposed to achievement. Um, and we start talking about like Peter Mel's 52. He just rode the best wave ever at Maverick. So, you know, like, Mick Fanning yeah. still rips like, you know, Kelly Slater was like winning world titles when he parted ways with Quicksilver. And um, I don't really have a point, but I just I wonder as someone who's lived through it, if you think that that trend is good, try to move yourself from it. You know, like if you weren't involved, because obviously you've panned out. But I think for every Jack Robinson, there was probably 100, 1000 kids that didn't make it, you know, and I don't know if that's the best thing for surfing. I want to get your thoughts on that. For sure, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I know because that was, you know, when I was starting, and that was the tail end of really the big contracts at a young age. It doesn't happen anymore, right? It's, it's, you know, that was that was then, and um, yeah, there were if you know if there was just unique cases of it, like you know, even uh, I, I just want to think there was big contracts, you know, Kolohe, everyone, all the guys had big contracts at a young age, but then it, I think, you know, the, the marketing thing and just the whole thing behind it, like, Oh, you know, I don't want to talk about myself as, as that, but it was, you know, I was, I was in there, you know, I had the bowl cut and everything. It was just a little, you know, I saw, saw so many kids run around for it. So I think it was, I think they definitely got their money's worth of how many kids I saw that were running around with bowl cuts and, and, you know, I don't know, there was so many kids that were kind of emulating, you know, that, and then, um, but yeah, I know what you're saying. Like, just just the company's paying for the potential, or what hasn't happened yet. It's um, yeah, it's it's a funny thing. I I don't know. It depends on the marketing. It depends on a lot of things. There's very unique cases that it only happens to. I, I I don't know if it you know is good for everything. It's just few, you know. For sure. And I, and I, I also wonder too, like you, you talk about starting to like travel at 12 and having all this time to develop as a surfer and it's obviously paid 
huge dividends um, in terms mm. of your ability and 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 it's almost one of those things where you go back to well should every pro surfer end up having to go through school or should you know people wait on contracts until they're older and um i don't know like i don't know how you compete if you do right because if you're not traveling the world at such a young age like those are experiences that are shaping you into the surfer you end up being yeah yeah no for sure um yeah it's I think I was lucky actually just to to start, you know, at such a young age and, and have all the support with that. Um, but I was also lucky, probably in a way, with with my dad there as well, even though he was, you know, if someone said something or he didn't like something and he thought it was going to come off bad on me, he was gnarly with it. But <laughs> And he was going to, you know, keep me away from it. But, um, yeah, it's it was such a unique case. Like he... You know, I had so many years, I think, until, you know, until I was around 16 and then I was a little older and I started to, you know, talk more. But it it was when I was a, when I was a young kid, um, you know, I was lucky to have all the support from the companies, but it was also, you know, it was just a lot of pressure and a lot of expectations. But I didn't feel it as much always because he would put it to the side. I don't know. I, I, I did feel it both ways. Though. I still felt it a little bit, you know, it was, um, yeah, yeah. It was funny well, let's that. talk about let's talk about surfers from West Oz because I've had the privilege of uh, going there a few times, and um, one of the prettiest places on the planet, some of the best waves on the planet. Some of, if if I'm being honest, like just the level, the communal level of surfing is so high. You know, there are like world class surfers there with you know, no stickers. They don't do contests. They don't travel, etc. And despite all that, like world class waves and like such a high level of talent in Western Australia, it produces very few CT surfers. You know, you and you and Bronte McCauley are representing on the um, men's and women's CTs at the moment. Uh, Taj has been on there. Um, you know, a uh, uh, Melanie Redmond Carr. But outside of that, nothing. You know, what is it, what is it about? What, what do you think that is? Like in terms of WA surfers not really wanting to take a run at the QS or just not doing it in a way where they qualify for the CT despite being such good surfers? Yeah, I've always thought about that as well. It's a good question because when I was growing up, there were so many other kids that they were doing all the contests. They were always there, you know, until oh, I would say about 15 and then they kind of wouldn't really keep doing it. And I always wonder, like, the waves are so good here. Why isn't there more real good guys that just want to go and just and rip and, and do the QS? Like, why, why doesn't anyone have the drive to go do that, Or you know? And then I think just, I mean, there's Jacob Wilcox. There's, you know, he's probably the next best guy that I surf with here, like, that, that I would go and surf with, and we have really good sessions. But outside, like, there's not many of us and um i think everyone just kind of (laughs) gets maybe a little spoiled too you know like we're here we've got good waves everything's pretty easy when it's all right at the doorstep and maybe they just don't have the drive to go do it i don't don't know what it is it's um you kind of have to break out of that because when i was starting to go and travel on the qs i was like oh do i really like doing this i'm going to these two foot waves and you know what's going on um, and I'd be worried about what was happening back here and the waves would be really good. So, um, yeah, you just, the more you travel, the, the more you kind of learn to let go of it and, and you're able to come back and, and, um, you know, just reset, not get stuck here. Cause I feel like it's one of those places like Hawaii or, you know, there's obviously a lot more surfers in Hawaii that it's a higher, you know, bigger talent pool mm. and everyone's going for it. Um, but here it's it's kind of a place where you just get stuck, one of those small towns and, and you can get stuck because there's good waves and not really see outside the bubble. I mean, there's an interesting parallel that you bring up Hawaii because a similar thing happens on the North Shore, or even like Indonesia, where where there's a lot of really good surfers. They're like, Well, why would I want to leave? You know, like I I like it here. I like the waves here and I don't I don't wanna leave, you know, and I yeah. and it maybe, you know, I I wonder if you've thought about this, but just being a bit of a man apart. Um, you know, like homeschooling and kind of walking your own path. I wonder if that led to you having a little bit of a different drive than than you, your community members out there. Yeah, I think so because I was always, 
you know, kind of self-started on just doing other things by myself. And, you know, I wasn't going to, whatever, whatever anyone else was doing here. Uh, and, you know, I wasn't going to just follow everyone else's lead on things and, and stay around here. Like I saw Taj, I watched him do his thing. And, and when he was on tour and he was a big inspiration, I was like, I want to be doing that. That's what, you know, that's mm. what, that's what excites me. And, and then, you know, you get your free surfers that are here and everything, but, but no, I, I never really kept my, you know, self in the bubble here. I always saw outside and, and I was lucky to travel and, and probably do that. So, uh, yeah, I was always, you know, just a little, di- I, I always loved to get out and see the world. That was, I was just so happy. I wasn't going to get stuck in the bubble. So, uh, you got to take, take your, uh, you know, be, be grateful, but it's also, uh, you can't get too spoiled and, and stay here. You got to, got to get outside and, and uh, go do things. So makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. You meant, you mentioned getting to spend a lot of time with really good surfers in WA when you were younger. Was Taj one of them? Did you spend a lot of time with him growing up? Yeah, I, I watched him a lot when I was younger and um, we surfed a fair bit. I always went up to yelling up and, and surfed with him where he lives. Um, but yeah, one of the, he was one of those guys that I feel like I'd, when he was out, I would always have good sessions, like I would lift my game. And that was, that was a guy when, you know, he was in probably the gnarliest era with Andy and, and Kelly and everyone that, um, you know, it was such a good era of surfing that I watched. I was, you know, I was always kind of brought, you know, brought up on that. So yeah, whenever I surf with Taj, that's when I got better and I had, had good sessions. I was like, ah, oh, you know, this is, this is a good environment. So uh, yeah, so fun being with, being with those guys. Uh, tell us a story of um, how old you were and, and what your experiences was the first time you, you paddled out and surfed the box. You mentioned graduating from the, uh, the river mouth there, but what, what was the story behind surfing the box for you the first time? <laughs> yeah, so uh, when I, the first time I ever went out there, it was, it was pretty solid. It was pretty big. And yeah, there was a, you know, all the guys were out. I think, I'm not sure if Yade and Nicka was out, um, but I know I went out with Dino Adrian. He's from here, you know, local. And he always surfed out there. And uh, he's like, let's go, let's, let's get out there. I was, you know. I was like, yeah, yeah, all right, all right, I'm, I'm down. And I was, you know, you're kind of nervous as well. It's, it's, you know, such a psycho wave. And, yeah, I was around 12, I think. And, um, <laughs> you know, it was big. It was, it was as big as last time they ran the contest out there, so it was really big. And uh, first wave I got, took off, this boogie boarder uh, took off behind me, then came around me. I went upside down first first wave looking back at the beach I was like oh wow like I was like holy shit like I'm gonna get smoked and then did get smoked and then the next one pretty much just got into it and barely even made it under the lip um and then got spat out in the channel but from then on I was like oh yeah this is you know you just kind of your instincts and just you know the you kind of you know you kind of know your way around the lineup and um I was like, oh, this wave, you know, I'm going to be, this wave's good. I know, I know what's going on out here now. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a crazy, crazy experience. I've always kind of gone like that, though, even in other waves around the world, like Pipeline and everything. I've always been a pretty instinctual surfer, I feel like. You kind of rely on, on reading the ocean a lot more and um, not so much everything else. Just, you know, it's very instinctual. It's hard to even document or explain that, that part. Yeah, I mean, I, I've I've talked about this a little bit on the podcast too, but I, I've always kind of likened it to that parallel of um, they say that if you want to become uh, truly fluent in a language, you got to learn it like you know when you're like four to six or six to eight or something really young. Now you can spend twenty years like studying Spanish, you know, from from like thirty to fifty, and you can be very very good, but you won't have the same fluency because you didn't learn it at the same time. And I always think of that when, when we're watching yet, to be honest, yourself or someone like John who are so, so comfortable in serious, serious waves. Like, I wonder if that part of your brain when it was forming because of those experiences has really helped you like read the ocean in that way in in, almost in kind of a fluency kind of way. 
I think so. I think it's the environment that you're in. Just when we're here, like growing up in Margaret River, it's such a raw coastline, like everything's so raw and it's all right in front of you. So, um, but yeah, when I was, even, you know, Gas Bay and when I was surfing heavy waves when I was young, it's, uh, it's just something that, that comes with it. I, I don't know what it is. It's, there's something that you can translate and go to other places in the world and, you know, it's, you know, you just feel it wherever you go, wherever wave, whatever ocean, it's just, it doesn't really matter. I think it, it translates and there's a certain knack for it that comes with it. I, I don't know how to even explain it. But when I've surfed with John or, you know, I, I feel like <laughs> when we surf together, the size doesn't matter. There's, you know, we're almost a problem because it's like, you know, each other's worst problem. We're just going to go and just push it and paddle waves that aren't possible or something's not possible. You still, you just see it differently. I don't know. It's, you know, it's all, it's all the same thing, but it's, it's just crazy, you know, and it's just in us. That's what I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that amount of power at those waves that you grew up surfing, um, inarguably kind of informed your approach to wave riding and there's a little bit of a minimalism and and a calmness to it but at the same time do you think that 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 also created a challenge for you as you've kind of said like when you're surfing waves without that kind of power you know when you're having to generate your own speed is that something that you think kind of came out of your development early on as a surfer yeah i think so it's you know i was so focused on on all that and you know, even just going to Chopu, testing my skills at all these other places, um, that when I did go and surf the real small waves on the QS, it was, I don't know what it was. It was just my brain wouldn't click and it wouldn't click into gear. I was going, what's, you know, what is this? And it, you just don't see it the same way. It's, you know, and then the more you do it and then, and, and then you know, you try to get better at that, then it starts to click into gear because, I was just always thinking like, how did I learn how to surf bigger waves? Good. It was always, it was always that. Um, you just have to rewire things. And, um, you know, I could learn that when I was younger. So there was no way I couldn't learn how to surf small waves or do that at a later point. It was, you just have to bring yourself back. It's, you know, it might take a little bit longer, but it, um, it'll happen. So. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Um, we have a couple more topics and we definitely have those listener questions that we mentioned, but we're going to take a quick break to get a word in from our sponsors and we'll be right back. All right. So we talked about how you were and are like sort of one of the more marquee surfers ever to come through the industry. You signed with Quicksilver at 12. You're part of the Young Guns crew with Kanoa and Leo. Is that when you first met Kelly Slater? Yeah, I remember the first day I met Kelly, we were on the Gold Coast and um, it was, yeah, me, Leo, Kanoa, we were all, all crews. We were meant to go, apparently we were going to go for a training session with Kelly. I was like, okay, cool. And we ended up in this like bull shark infested river in like Corumban somewhere. <laughs> and we're running along the bottom, we're carrying rocks under under the water, underwater rock, uh, water, underwater running. And um, I was like, oh, what are we doing? And then I went surfing with him. Um, out at Palm Beach and we were all out there. Um, but I think I became more friends with Kelly, you know, once I was a bit older and, you know, we started to talk more and surf more together. Um, but, yeah, it was really cool. You know, it was, good. It was a pretty cool experience just just being around him and, you know, I always, I always sort of, you know, looked up to him. I was, you know, always watched what he was doing. It was I learned a lot, lot off Kelly. He's, um, you know, one of those type of guys, you know, special guys, just, uh, yeah. So many, so many things to talk about it was, it was, yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> how, how has your relationship changed since you first met him? Like what, what is it like today versus what it was like, uh, you know, that river in a Corumban river? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I think, you know, I was younger, but I was, I was always kind of like, not awkward, but you know when you like uh, kind of stand off, like you know. And I'm always like, I'm cool. But when I was when I was younger, I was always kind of not like stand off, but like just kind of feel people out, like see how they were. You know, kind of check them out. I think he was kind of checking me out too when I was a kid. It was really funny. Like, and then we started to surf more together, and and 
and stuff in Hawaii and, you know, over here. And, um, yeah, it's just, I, I think I just grew up by and, you know, now, you know, just surfing with people like that. People are on, you know, such high levels. Um, you know, you just can relate to, relate to people like that. He's, um, you know, I love my chest. I think Kelly loves his chest and just things like that. He's interested in things like that. It's really funny, like, and, and just the way he sees the ocean and, you know, just a lot to take out from, um, you know, being around those type of guys and, and experiencing it. So, yeah. Totally. And, and I'd imagine that there's a, a ton of parallels just in terms of, like he grew up in the spotlight, you grew up in the spotlight. Is that something that you guys ever talk about kind of overtly or or does he ever give you kind of helps or tips on on how to navigate it? Yeah, I you know, I think no, he doesn't doesn't talk about it too much. We were always, you know, just surfing together and kind of, you know, we'd rock up at certain places together and we'd, you know, we'd be in the same thing just naturally, you know, be be there together and and, and doing that, but no, I never really talked too much about it. It was, you know, I see how many people, you know, come up to him and how much he's in the spotlight still, you know, there's just so many people that, that know Kelly Slater. So, um, yeah, I, you know, I don't, don't talk about it too much with him, but I can see, you know, it's, yeah, it's such a, such a funny thing being at the top and, and being there, you know, he's a unique human. It's, uh, yeah. It's, there's a lot that comes with it and yeah, I don't know. It's, yeah, I don't know how to explain it. It's just, it's all, you know, it's lonely as well against the competitors because, you know, he's the best for so long and, and probably just seeing him, you know, he, he doesn't put too much out there. He does his own thing. Not many competitors know much about him, you know, it's, um, so to spend time with him, that's, that's cool. And I can just see, you know, you, you always got to keep, keep things close and, when you're trying to get to the top, that's, you know, everyone's always trying to come after you. So, uh, yeah, um, it's harder staying there like he has. And I think he's kept a good mystique about him. Yeah, that's a good, it's, it's a, it's a good point. And Jordy brought it up when he and I talked about, he's like, I don't put everything on social media. I don't put everything like my training and what I do out there. Why would I like, that's my competitive advantage. And is that something that you get, you kind of navigate week to week, even on your own where you say like, all right, I'd, this is for me and this is, this is for the public. Like you kind of, do you kind of um, create a distance between who you are publicly and who you are in, in real life? I mean, I, I think when I was younger, it was always like that. I never really showed too much. Now, nowadays I, you know, there's, you know, I'm a really approachable people can come up and talk to me or, you know, see me, but just on social media and, and showing everything, I think you have to keep a certain mystique and, you know, because once everything is out there, there's, you know, you can't get it back. There's only, you know, we're all trying to, we're all in the same weight class on tour, you know, really, it's you're going against <laughs> everyone. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I think if you just, you keep that, people are always going to be wondering and, you know, to this day, people are always wondering about Kelly, what is, what is, what, is, what makes Kelly tick, you know? And, um, yeah, it's, it's a really funny topic. I always just, yeah, uh, um, you know, you keep your things close to your chest. What makes you tick um, is, you know, it's kind of, it's just for you, you know, and, and yeah, that's it. Yeah. And so how long were you with Quicksilver for? Uh, five years and then Billabong for five years after that. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and. The, you know, the media loves to kind of talk up the trade news a lot. Did these feel like huge shifts for you when you shifted from Quicksilver to Billabong and then Billabong for Volcom for you personally? Yeah, I remember when I was when I was young. Yeah, that was. I think I think there was just so many things that that happened. But yeah, it was it was a you know big shift. I was always. I remember when that was a Quicksilver and. You know, I still had a contract and everything, but, you know, I kind of, there was a lot of things riding on, you know, the end of Hawaii season and, um, you know, I had, my contract was coming up and, you know, I don't know if I was going to get the same contract that I had. And then I ended up 
winning the pro junior at sunset. And then that's when, you know, I was already negotiating with Volcom um, during that time and Billabong. So it was the same, you know, it was all happening at the same time. And uh, I remember I won the pro junior there and then, you know, we were were negotiating with Volcom and then Billabong came in and there was, you know, all the wildcard opportunities and just, you know, the contests when it was, you know, more so I think back then there was, you know, all the wild cards and, um, yeah, that was a thing. It was a big, big shift and, uh, yeah, I got that contract and, um, yeah, that was, was a big one for such a young age. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, I'll talk about it now. It's, uh, they were all, all good contracts. So, uh, yeah, it was, you know, in my mind, I wasn't too worried about it at a young age. It was the media made it up at such a big thing and, I was just going surfing still, to be honest. It was, you know, it's what it is. I mean, yeah. Maybe it, maybe it <laughs> paid for the farm, right? It paid for the farmhouse. Yeah, 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 exactly. Pay for the gingerbread house. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, boys. No, um, but yeah, that, it gave me a lot of opportunities. So yeah, for cool. sure. Yeah, and and you mentioned the dip a, a little bit, and I, I wanted to talk about that from a few different angles. There's there's probably a performance angle where you in your own way had to kind of slay the hype monster that had been created around you and, and, and work your way onto the tour. Um, you know, I, a, a little bit about maybe your dad transitioning from, from being there all the time to, to not, um, starting yeah. to work with, with Matt Bemrose and then, and then getting married. I mean, I, I'd imagine all that came out of kind of a pivotal phase for you. Um, so I wanted you to, Give us some details about all that. Yeah, let's get into it. I mean, yeah, when when I was, you know, from, from a young age, there was, you know, I think my, my dad was so serious with it and there was, you know, there was a lot of things riding on it. It was, you know, I'd get in from, from heats and I think I took the losses pretty hard. You know, when I was having that dip, it was, you know, the losses, we were just, we taking it hard and um yeah i know he wanted to wanted me to do good but then it was you know just it was also a lot of, you know i was like whoa you know like it was it's pretty gnarly you know like just just rebounding you know like and and being able to go to the next contest um you know i was so worried about it every time i was in heats and you know i'd, I'd be be so worried about everything else, what was going on when, you know, if I, you know, just my, my dad just, there was a lot of pressure too, you know, like it was, it was harsh. The, the feedback was super harsh, you know, it'd be, you know, everything would be wrong, you know what I mean? I would be going, why, why, you know, why is everything, oh, am I doing everything wrong? What's going on? You know, it's, oh yeah, you should have done this, should have done that. And then, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think there was just so many, so much pressure. I wasn't seeing it with, you know, my own view on things always. I needed to just step back and go, all right, let's simplify it. It was really all all I had to do. I had the talent, had everything else there. It was just a big game going up on in, in here. You know? Well that and that like we talked about before, like that becomes a real interesting, like, yeah, like this is we're blurring the personal and professional. Like this is my dad. He's been here the whole time and but it can get really it can get really tough. Yeah, it it can and um yeah, I think it it can sort of, you know, it's it's it sort of stuns the talent, you know, in a way like it, it's, it sort of stalls it, and you you kind of you're leading away from that, and you know, you know, you always know what's, you know, always know, but you know, a lot of the time, you, you know, I've always kind of ran on my instincts and doing what I was doing, and you know, knowing okay, yeah, this is how I'm going to do it, and and yeah, sort of, sort of led away from that a bit, and. Um, we would always just go back and forth. I mean, it was, yeah, it was some some funny times until, but also it's real harsh as well. Like it was just, it's it's you know when you're family, it's always you're gonna. There's no filter on anything, so you're just gonna you know say whatever. And um, yeah, I think just coming through that as a kid, and you know all the pressure mixed in as well. He was probably feeling it as well from the companies, and then. You know, it would come out on on me, and then it was showing the performance too. You going, you're not showing your best performances then, and mm. um, yeah, that's 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 how it was. Like, I think once those years passed, and I was free to do what I was doing, and 
and come through it. And yeah, that's when I really showed myself. You guys are good now. Does he come over to the gingerbread house? <laughs> no, I, I haven't seen him yet while I'm back. I, I missed him yesterday out in the water. He was paddling out, you know, and, um, but I'll see him while I'm here. He'll, you know, we're all good. I'm growing up now and I'm, he sees what I'm doing. You know, I think he was probably so worried about me that, you know, and when people talk to a dad, they, it would come off and go, they would go, oh, what just, what hit me? What, what just happened? You know, like. <laughs> I've had a few of those know? experiences. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're going to say, and you talk to everyone in the industry, they've all got a story going, oh my God, like how? And then, <laughs> I mean, I'm the nice kid behind it all. And, um, you know, he didn't care how it was going to come across to people. It was, you just go, what? Like, what, what are you saying? And then. Yeah, it was. Um, I could dive into so many stories. There's especially make a movie on the five years that I was on the, you know, doing contests, starting to get into, you know, professional level. And um, yeah, that was <laughs> some wild times. And I've seen, yeah, it was, you know, I think he wanted the best for me in the end, no matter how it came across. And, you know, he sees what I'm doing now and probably, he's probably, you know, really happy. Probably now, you know. So. Um, oh my God! Of yeah. course, yeah. So, what, and what was your? What was your? Yeah, I mean, I guess if he never qualified, he'd be able to hold that shit over you for a while. The what was the sequencing with you in the sense of like, all right, Dad, like we're gonna try something different in terms of landing somewhere with with Bemrose, who's kind of filled the coaching role for you in a, in a major way. Yeah. Well, I was. I would say Bemrose came in once, you know, I was always friends with Bemrose for years and he knew my dad for a long time. Uh, but I would say I, I started working with him when I got on Volcom. So when I started not traveling with my dad, that was when I met Julia, my wife now. And that was the time where I started to travel alone and do things so that, you know, independently I was starting to, you know, do everything alone. And um, yeah, that was the time he's going, what's, what are you doing? What? I'm just going to, I'm not staying home. Like I'm coming. I was like, oh, no, I'm just going to do my thing. I'm going to go, you know? And, um, yeah. <laughs> I think that was the time, you know, and when he sort of, you know, start to, it's hard, you know, cause you travel for so long and so many years he's, you know, taken me everywhere. And, you know, I think it's, I think it was hard for him and, you know, it was, and for me as well, I was going, you know, whoa, like, yeah okay, I'm going to do this all on my own. And, but, you know, I, I wasn't. I was with Julia and we were, we were traveling around and I was just finding my feet really and, um, yeah, just, just being able to sort of do what you want and, you know, being able to express yourself and, and uh, yeah, I feel like it's all, it's all come now. You know, I'm all, I'm, I am me now. You know, what, they, what people see of me and when they see me is, you know, I am who I am. People... I'm free to talk and, and do whatever I want, you know. It's um, yeah, it's growing up and uh, yeah. But but when Ben Rose came along and and we started traveling together, um, you know, it was good. It's just good when you connect with people, even though if they work at the same company, um, you know, if we can talk about anything. And um, you know, Bemmy's a amped human. He's pretty pretty <laughs> fired up. So loves competition, loves everything, but also has my back with it and. Um, yeah, just work well together. It's, you know, it's good when you don't have to try with people and everything flows. So uh, that's how the relationship is right now. Yeah. 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 And it's obviously paid, paid pretty big dividends for you. Um, there, there's, and this goes back to kind of the media versus reality, but maybe the media is right on this one. Can you explain your current relationship with Julian Wilson um, and the quote unquote rivalry <laughs> that's being hyped up, um, certainly at the WSL, but I, I, I vividly, so the first time this has been my experience with it and you can kind of say if I'm right or wrong, I, th the Tweed event, the countdown event last year, I think happened kind of right after he had parted ways with Hurley. So that seemed particularly charged with him and you beat him. Um, and it felt like there was a bit of tension after that heat. And then you guys have just had the good fortune for, for everyone's entertainment to run into each other again a few more times. So a couple of, of things, I guess. Number one, number one, 
how if if you, if Julian Wilson if you call Julian Wilson right now would he pick up the phone? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, Have you ever but, called Julian Wilson's? Maybe that's maybe the number one question. Yeah, no. So I never called Jules, but um, yeah, I know that. Yeah, he's uh, he knows what's up, and um, yeah, I, I know that when we surf against each other, every time Julia's, I mean Ju- <laughs> Julian's fired up every time <laughs> we surf against each other, and um, you know from that event on. I don't know, because when I first met Julian, I was just a young kid and he was on the Gold Coast. He beat Kelly mm. back then mm-hmm. and that was when he was coming through. And and then and then on, I don't know, it, I knew that, you know, once I got on tour and, and it's going to happen now that I'm here and they all watch me as the little cute kid growing up, the bowl right. cut. That's not me <laughs> anymore. I'm here now. It's, you know, we're all growing up, we're all bigger and... They know, they know I'm here. Just it's, it's a new ball in the yard, like really, like and and you just got to have, you you know, you don't try and be, you know, this new guy trying to wave your flag and do everything, but you can't stand down to anyone, and um, we're all competitors. Don't you know? I had all, you know, I looked up to Julian and looked up to you know all the guys that are on tour, but I'm looking at him now. So um, you know, Julian, the fire's there and. Uh, yeah, it's definitely there's definitely a thing there for sure. He goes, I like how competitive you are, and I said, Yeah, well, you know, of course, like we're we're gonna go at it, and um, you know, I just I don't. It's 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 funny. I love rivalries, you know, like it's it's good because he surfs good, and you know, it's he's one of those guys that I think I'm gonna have a lot of heats with, and um, you know, you just try to paddle over each other. Really, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be good for the the people to watch. Yeah. The the psychology thing behind it's very interesting because you can almost draw a parallel to when Julian was coming up and you know Kelly, you know Ke- Kelly's psychology intimidated so many surfers that should have beat him over the years, especially, you know, probably in the 2010s in a lot of ways. Like he beat so many people before they even paddled out and um there were very few surfers that could kind of like defend against that. You know, uh, um, Owen actually was one of them who could as a wild card. Like he really had mm. Kelly's number in a lot of ways. B. Durbage was another one as well. Um, but a lot of surfers like, you know, would kind of crumble where you're like, why are you crumbling in front of him? You you could surf this wave better than him. You should you should really take it to him. And is that is that something just that approach of like, I'm not looking up to them anymore. I'm looking at them. Is that something that you've worked on with a professional or is that just sort of your own your own approach to competition that you've come up through experience? I think through the experiences as well. Like I, I knew that if I'm always, you know, got the, the, you know, they're, they're my idols in the heat, you know, Oh my God, like it's them. It's, I'm not going to show my best performances and uh, you know, just always being able to think moves ahead, you know, like, like, a, you know, it may sound simple, but playing a lot of chess and doing things like that when you, you know, it's always hard to think ahead. And when you verse other humans and, you know, you, you do that and you think steps ahead of them, that's, that's when you can take it to another level. And you already have them done before the, the battle starts, you know, and, and that's, you know, whatever it is, it's mind games or whatever it is. I think you see the look in their eyes, it tells a lot. And, you know, you, you, you can just feel people's energy with things, you know, when you're, when you're steps ahead, I think Kelly's always a lot of steps ahead of guys when he's um, competing against him. Um, but yeah, no ma- you know, I don't know how many steps ahead he is thinking ahead, but he's ahead. So um, yeah, it's just a funny thing. It's always, it's sort of a mental kind of warfare thing. It's like, you know, you, you're really playing with guys and it may sound kind of evil sometimes, but that's just competition. I, I, yeah, it's, um, I'm not evil though. I'm a nice person. But, yeah. <laughs> in addition uh, to competition, um, word on the street is, is that you've got, uh, you're in the running for the end section banger for Logan Dooley and Snap 4. Um, so talk to me a little bit about balancing preparation for competition versus bagging video clips for free surfing how, how, are, are those one in the same for you are you intentional 
day to day about which is which and they're very different. What's, what's that like for you? Yeah, they're both very different. Like, yeah, balancing that out is always hard. I remember when John was on tour, I actually don't know how he pulled all that crazy footage together. I mean, he's so good, of course, he's going to do it. But balancing the tour and filming a full-time movie like that, it's so hard. But when, you know, when this happened with the Snap 4 video, I think we were just lucky to have the whole year off and, and be able to be able to do that because I don't, I don't know if I would have had time otherwise. It's just so hard to do that. It would take a lot more time. Um, you know, and just to find those good sessions. But I think that section that will come out, it'll be some of the best surfing that people have seen, you know, and, um, you know, for a long time in a movie. So that'll be pretty cool. I'm pretty stoked on it. Um, yeah. He, Logan, uh, who's a friend of mine, he's been on the podcast, he also told me that you are the healthiest surfer he's ever met in his life. Um, everything <laughs> from your diet to yoga to sobriety and and I, I wanted you to talk a little bit about that so um, yeah yeah I, where do we even start like um let's just start with um sobriety so you don't drink you don't do drugs no seen never it have. all but never seen have it all. sure seen it all but never have no it's uh i mean yeah i've i've drank before but i i don't do it really and um yeah just 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 a personal kind of thing i just you know, just performing and, you know, doing what I do. I, I kind of get sick on alcohol. So I just, you know, that's just not, just not something I do always. And, um, on my wedding. Yeah. That's when I, you know, last time I was, I was drunk, but yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Other than that, um, always been into diet, even from a young age, I think, um, you know, I was lucky with my parents around. They, they were always into that. And, um, yeah, I think I just carried it on and, you know, it was a personal thing, but that's, I always saw, I was like, okay, the little things I need to take care of the little things because, you know, that'll always get me to where I want to be. And just, just having those good habits, I think, uh, you know, it shows in my performances. Well, what, you know, you what's can, that diet like? Is it, are you vegan, vegetarian, just, just healthy, organic food? What is that? No, nah, just all, all organic usually. And, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a meat eater, so I'm not a vegan, but, uh, yeah, I, the main thing was is, you know, the, the, the alcohol and just, you know, that, that kind of thing. I'm always, I've always just been conscious of, of trying to eat pretty well. And, um, yeah, that's, that's just been a big part of being an athlete is, uh, is doing that. Compared to what Logan eats, though, maybe he's uh, <laughs> having some, you know, <laughs> he's always got the, maybe got the McDonald's and, the, and certain other things. But, uh, yeah. Be, being <laughs> behind the camera is a completely different experience, I promise. Yeah, it is. When, yeah. And when did you when did you get started in yoga? Because I've been hearing like crazy Jedi stories from our our box to box crew as well of a view on the Swiss ball and and sometimes I'm hearing you do you do yoga for hours a day. Is that right? Yeah, a couple of hours a day sometimes. Uh, yeah, it's another thing. I, I never really used to train when I was a kid, you know, like you kind of just surf and and you just do things. But once once I got to around, you know, 17, I started getting into yoga and then all the training after that came, you start training way harder. Um, but yeah, yoga, the breathing, so many different breathing protocols that I'm into. And um, yeah, it's, you know, just, just becomes, you just, you just just become, uh, you know, have the have the sensei kind of mindset. You know, got to be got to be the master. You know, try to learn from the masters at least. And um, yeah, it's you know, start my day with that. It's always it's always what I do now. So um, yeah, that's one of the one of the secrets. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. So so this podcast is going to drop. I'm going to guess the day, a couple of days into the window for the Boost Mobile yeah. Margaret River Pro presented by Corona. Lots of swell forecast. Where do you think we're going to be running? Well, I know Margaret's is going to be big the first day. Uh, yeah, and it'll probably be 10 to 12 foot, I would say. And then after that, I reckon we're going straight into the box. It's going to be the next day. Um, everyone's been asking me what's it going to be like, but... <laughs> you know, what the box was last year, I think it's going to be like that on the Monday. So the second day and then the next day even could be out there again. So hmm. 
I think everyone's amped. And, you know, we've, we had pipe and we had a couple beach break events and now we're back into the juice again. So it's, it's good. It's going to change it up for everyone again. And you're going to see, you know, how everyone performs and how everyone's drawing their lines. But, uh, yeah, I know, I know we, it's going to be exciting and that's what everyone wants to see. So, um, yeah, I think, I think it's, we're in for, we're in for a good few days and, uh, yeah, be excited for it. This is it's going to be on. Now, how do you switch your boards up, like Hawaii to beach breaks, back home? Or are you use the same boards from Hawaii at home? Are you are you still running Arakawas? Is are you working with different shapers? What does that look like for you? Yeah, I'm still running Arakawas. Uh, he's been shaping for me for almost ten years now. So just the relationship over those years, I you know, it's more of a personal kind of family thing now. Um, and you know we're so so into it that you know it's it's a it's a family thing like it's just always you know I stayed with Eric this year in Hawaii and um, you know when you're that close to people and you know you're working on stuff like that you can never buy that it's um, you know it's always that that that's always going to be there so I've just been riding Eric's all around the world we've worked on things you know I did ride a few JS's. You know, when I first started with Eric, I was riding a few around the world and um, I was on Mayhem's as well. But now I'm just on Eric's. Um, and, you know, Eric's such a good shaper that I think even if he wasn't, do, you know, into the small wave stuff as much, he, he's at least adapted and, um, you know, has come so far with it. So, yeah, um, you know, it got, got me through the QS and, and all that. So, uh yeah, it's just, you know, that relationship coming from Hawaii, there's, you know, a lot of things that are similar here and um, I take all around the world now, so it's amazing. And the upcoming yeah. event in Rottnest Island, I think, if I'm, unless I'm mistaken, you might be the only surfer on tour who's actually surfed there before. Um, what's that, is, A, is that true? And then B, if so, what, what's that place like? Yeah, so I, I talked to um, Owen and, I heard Julian has surfed out there as well. I think we're the only three guys that have surfed out there. So, um, you know, it's more than everyone else. But, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a super fun wave. And, you know, we were talking about yesterday. I think, I think everyone's going to have fun over there. It's, it's you know, super rippable. Um, but, yeah, it's another stop on tour that will be, be good fun. And two events in my home state, so I can't complain. But, um, <laughs> But yeah, I'm just excited to see everyone rip. Really, you know, it's it's gonna be gonna be good. I want to see exciting surfing, and um, yeah, it's gonna be shown. I w- I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you if you had a shark story growing up in Western Australia. I got a bunch for you. What's what's the what's your favorite? What's your favorite in terms of? I'm glad I have that story. I'm glad I'm still here. Okay. Short story long or long story short? Long, long as you can give me all the details. <laughs> I, I, I do not want to sleep tonight. <laughs> all right. So, I mean, I, growing up here, I don't know. I think, I don't think it's as gnarly as everyone thinks. I think it was worse a little while ago. Now it's not as bad. But I'll tell you some, some times when I was growing up and it's, it's pretty gnarly. Like, so we got, there's this wave you know, where North Point is, there's this other wave across the bay and it's called Huzzers. And um, I was surfing out there one day, really beautiful day. Sun was out, water was clear as, and there was these dolphins out the back. And then there was this, you know, we were, we were about probably 200 metres out and the, the fin I seen after these dolphins was about another 200 metres away and it was huge, like big, great white. And... Uh, it's just cruising along, and I looked at the Malibu right next to me. I'm like, he looked at me, and we already just knew that. I mean, he was like, you want to jump on my board? I said, no, 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 I'm just going to stay close. And, and then it, it sort of went out, and where you go out from Huzzers, the whole big bay from North Point around to Huzzers, and then it goes to South Point. And it's pretty sharky out there because there's a few seals that hang out there, so it's kind of known for it. But it cruised out there, and then my dad ran out for a surf, jumped off the back of the point, not knowing anything, like, you know, just cruising. And he kind of felt something, he reckons, and, and then he caught a wave and paddled across the channel to Huzzers, which the shark was just at and just, just came through. I mean, it is a big one. And I go, oh, yeah, it was a 
really big shark just there then, like really big great white. He goes, oh, yeah, I felt something, eh, mate? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm sure you did. Like, but it was, it was just cruising. It was a nice day. I, he goes, were you scared? And I go, no, I wasn't too scared because it was, it was just cruising. And then the second one, and this is pretty gnarly. I, you know, this is, this is heavy. I had two kind of similar cases. I was up at Injured Up Car Park. And it was late in the afternoon and, you know, it was offshore, perfect, not a drop of water out of place. And I'm sitting there waiting for this set on dark and I see this huge foam ball coming towards me out on this wave. And it's coming down the wave a metre high almost and a metre wide for sure. It's coming down the wave and I'm looking at it I'm like, the wave's not capping out there. There's no reef out there. What the hell is this? And then it got about probably... 30 metres away from me and then just went boom, and turned on itself. And then I caught the wave, somehow made it all the way to the beach, got to the beach, kissed the beach. I was just like, oh, my God. And it was the craziest moment because then after that, a couple of years later, I was out of that same wave and then there was these couple of dolphins that were coming towards me. You know, everyone thinks dolphins, you know, you're in the water and there's dolphins. You're safe. That's not true. It's big shark doesn't care, I swear. And it was coming towards me. These dolphins went under us in the wave. And then the next set, I see this huge fin coming towards me. It's coming from way back. And it was a huge, huge great white, like big submarine one. And it's coming towards me. I'm looking at it. I'm like, holy shit, like I, I can't go anywhere. And there's this wave coming. And I, it was... You know, it was like a swell kind of. And I remember I couldn't go anywhere. And, um, and this, and actually, no, you know what happened now? I refresh my memory is Damon Easter, a big wave guy from here. Mm-hmm. He was mm-hmm. actually on the inside of me. I didn't know what to do. I, I, in the moment, I had the biggest brain fart and I was, I was sitting there and the shark's coming towards me. He took off on the wave and I should have dropped in on him and gone. <laughs> the shark's coming towards me in the wave. My friend's on the inside. She saw it. And she's seen this thing go through the wave. The sun's shining through it. And it's seriously like probably maybe a, almost a 20-foot great white cruising through, coming after me. And it goes under me. It sounds unrealistic, but it goes, went under me. I just didn't know what to think. I'm like, oh, uh, I don't know what to do. What am I going to do? You know, like I'm, I'm done. And, and then I belly boarded this one in and got to the beach. And um, I don't know if the shark was chasing the dolphins, but I got to the beach and... Um, and yeah, just go, how big was it? And she goes, it was a huge one, you know, like that was, that was really big. And uh, yeah, that was, I don't know if it, it guaranteed it saw me, but I'm not sure if it was chasing the dolphins. It was, it was weird, but um, yeah, I've had a few cases like that. And uh, yeah, I've had, I think I also, I had, a, I had one in Newcastle, actually. I think it was a, it was a white when, when all those sharks all that year when the cop was mm-hmm. on yep. um, and I was paddling for this one wave. I saw Harry Bryan actually was to the side of me and I seen his eyes just go wide like, like, and then I was like, oh no. And I was paddling and I just turned around kind of instinctly and just without even thinking, just turned around and it just went boom, like behind me. It was coming for me, behind me, pretty big oh. shark. It was a great white. And um, I think when you turn around like that, it was probably shocked that I did that, wasn't ready for it. Um, you know, because they, you know, I've always kind of been scared of dogs on the street. And when I am more scared, they usually run after me and want to bite me. So, <laughs> um, you know, that's what I could probably relate it to. It was, you know, you actually, you are, you are way, you know, you just way more, you know, you weren't standing down and you turned around at it. I, look, I, you know, pointed my board at it and, um, it was probably, probably go, Oh, what was that? I don't, I don't want to, you know, have a go at it. Um, but yeah, it's you can't explain those moments when you got a big animal like that coming at you. It's um, probably yeah, it's just what to do, and it's, it's not really anything what to do. It's just you really have to have control of yourself because I think they do feel the scaredness. You know, you see seals when they're around, and you know they're scared. I've seen seals come through the lineup before, and seal will be hanging around you and then it'll dart off and, it, and it's like what's it doing but it's almost like the seals lead the sharks to you sometimes and I think <laughs> when they're getting chased by a big great white um, I think they almost try to lead them to you sometimes so I don't like seals 
I, I know <laughs> I don't really like, I don't like surfing with them at least because, um, you know, you just get a little scared of them here. But, uh, yeah, I, I think animals, more than us, more than anything, animals really pick up on, um, you know, they sense, sense things in the water or sense things, you know, when you have a certain energy, they, they know. So um, they sense fear. So, yeah. So yeah. is that how you kind of approach getting back in the water after that? You're like, well, you know, I just don't think about it until I'm faced with the situation because if I'm not thinking about it, I'm just thinking about surfing and that's the best energy to give off. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, you know, you could be strong and you could be strong, but you could also, it can also be silly too sometimes. Like, oh, I'm not, I'm going to be oblivious to it and not, not think about it. But, um, you know, I've had moments, I, I bet I've had way more moments that they've been looking at me than I've known them that they're there. So, you know, I've been out of the box before. And this is actually a good story. <laughs> this is another great white. <laughs> uh, this seen about five or six, but so we were out there with Jacob Wilcox, Noah Dean, Creed was out there. We're all out there, all the boys from here. And um, we're all sitting there in this big bunch and uh, <laughs> we're out the box. You know, it's a tight takeoff zone. You, you ride on the edge of the shelf. And um, this is a few years ago when it was really bad. And one of the boys seen it coming, coming in the way. They seen it coming towards us. Jacob saw it. I, didn't, I, didn't, I barely even saw it, but it was coming up and it was real thick. It's a pretty thick one. And we're all sitting there and they're just, boy, shark, shark. And then we start paddling in because if you go in over the box on the reef, it's all dry reefs, pretty gnarly. But we're still like 50 metres away. And the shark's coming towards us. And I've literally just started paddling. I've jumped up on Jacob. I'm like literally pushing him underwater. He's like, get off me, bro. I'm like, no, no, I'm not getting off you. I'm paddling straight over you. And I'm like, we, we just paddle straight over each other. Noah Dean's at the back. He looks like a seal. He's got his booties on. The shark's coming towards us. There's about 10 of us. And we literally are barely making it to the rocks. And then the jet ski comes in between us and the shark. And the shark dives down. And then Tom Jennings, the water photographer, he's swimming in the channel, not even worried about it. Like, <laughs> he got left out there. And, um, but, yeah, it, was, it, it wasn't really letting itself be seen. And I think that was when it was going to come up and have a go at one of us. And, um yeah, that was that was interesting. It was um, you know just seeing the, their habits and um, you know we weren't even thinking about it. It was such a nice day, but it, it it wasn't letting itself be seen. It was coming up to to have another look at us. So um, yeah, pretty scary though. So yeah, yeah. Geez. Well, hopefully the the swell forecast for the the event will probably keep them away. It's probably too big and nasty for them to have to deal with it. Yeah, it's interesting. They, they you know, I, I think it was a phase where all that stuff happened and then there was a, those attacks years ago. So, um, mm. you know, just, you know, South Africa's gnarly. There's a lot of gnarly places out there, you know, that's, sure. they're there. It's the ocean. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, we mentioned that we put some questions out to the Instagram community and there was a lot of interest, but we've, uh, we've whittled it down to three. So the first question is from Alyssa Toll who asks, when you aren't surfing, what do your workouts look like? Um, yeah, so when, I, when I'm not surfing, I mean, it can be like obviously the yoga, but all the functional stuff that I'm doing, like a lot of functional training, a lot of body weight stuff. Um, yeah, it's, you know, my workouts are kind of growing and growing. The more I learn, the more I'm actually starting to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, even also just working on my mind a lot besides the physical stuff is great, but just, you know, I have to, you know, keep the mind ticking as well. And a lot of things is it's, you know, competition is there's a lot of things, a lot of moving parts, a lot of variables. So, uh, yeah, just, you know, between chess and trying to read there's a lot of books that's, uh, you know, just as much mental as it is physical. So yeah, that's what it consists of. <laughs> All right. K yeah. Beachy asks, what's your go-to snack during the day? Go-to snack? Yeah. Uh, yeah, smoothies probably. Yeah, probably. I mean, or like, you know, I used to eat a lot of lollies and chocolate, but no more. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm a, yeah, that's, that's go-to smoothies 
It would be what banana, go, banana. What goes in? Oh, but that guy's going to ask what goes in them. Yeah, what goes in a banana, almond butter, and uh, yeah, banana, almond butter, and that's it. Banana, almond butter, almond milk smoothies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, Philippe Bensek asks, who do you think is funnier, Kelly or John John? Who's funnier? Yeah. <laughs> um, they both got their own ways, but you know, I think John's pretty quiet, Lisa. That you know, he doesn't show himself too much, but he is funny when you hang out with him, and you know, he is he is pretty classic. Um, but then, yeah, Kelly's Kelly's always you know, I think Kelly's really funny. Actually, he's you know, whatever Kelly's doing, it's. You know, he's always got something behind it. You know, what's he plotting or doing something? So, uh, yeah, he's he's a cool guy to cruise with. I think I think Kelly's Kelly's pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we have our final segment, the lightning round. So these are ten questions. You answer as fast as you can. If you could only have one board set up for the rest of your life, single fin, twin fin, thruster, quad, bonzer, or finless, which would you choose? Oh, thruster all day. <laughs> Coffee or tea? Tea. Burrito or pizza? Burrito. Last book you read? What is it? Last book you read. Oh, what is that? Oh, last... <laughs> there was a glitch in the system. Last, <laughs> last, last... I say, said last bookie you did. I was like... I, was, yeah, I wasn't sure what that was. Uh, last book I read. Um, uh, embrace the suck. That's the Navy SEAL one. Yeah. Best surf film ever. Woo! Probably Trilogy. That for me, that was a good one. One wave you never have to go back to. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I have to go back to a couple of them. So, uh, <laughs> But one wave, the worst wave that, well... Damn. You know what? Uh, <laughs> you got me here because I've been to a lot of bad ones and I think I'm going to probably have to go back to them. But for me, probably, uh, oh, my God. I would say Virginia Beach, but I've never been there. But probably uh, Manly's pretty bad when it's, it's not. But whatever. I don't care. Yeah. To be honest, I don't care. Yeah. If you only get to surf one way for the rest of your life? Um, probably North Point. Yeah. Best person to share the lineup with? Best person to share the lineup with? Um, ooh. Florence Brothers are pretty good. Had some good sessions at Chopes with Nathan. Um. Always pushing it, always looking out, and yeah, probably probably those those guys are pretty good. Yeah, worst person to share the lineup with. <laughs> yeah, it depends where we're at, but yeah, to be honest, I mean, it's hard to get waves in a lot of places. I don't know. There's that's a bit of a bit of a controversial one. No, I don't know. <laughs> There's a uh, yeah, guys used to be worse, I think. I think on tour now, there's guys that everyone's pretty pretty well-mannered. So, um, yeah, the hardest place probably to get waves is in Hawaii. That's probably the hardest place. So it's more than just one person that's, that's hard to share the lineup with. Fair. Last one. Finish this sentence. I will next achieve a state of happiness by... By... Oh, what did you say? I would next. Comp- what did you say? Because sorry, it's glitching. Uh, a bit. I, no, it's all good. I will next achieve a state of happiness by. Mm, by just being me, being being happy. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jack Robinson, thanks so much for joining us on the lineup. Good luck in the Boost Mobile Margaret River Pro presented by Corona. We appreciate your time and your candor, man. Good luck. Look forward to watching you this season. Thank you. Appreciate for the call. And, um, yeah, excited to 
keep this year going. So, yeah, thank you.